Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's uh, good to be with you, even though we're kind of in the isolation mode. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to our brother Jim Miller, who uh, helped me download this program that enables us to record the sermon like this. And also, not only did he help me download it, he also tutored me on its use. I'm still learning, so bear with us. Thank you for your patience. Brother Charles Coyle was the president of International Bible College when Betty and I were students there back in 19, from 1987 to 1990. And in one of his chapel talks, he related the story of how when he was in London, England, he had opportunity to go to the Tower of London and see the crown jewels of England. And after the tour guide was through showing them all the jewels, he invited questions. And Brother Coyle asked the question, sir, what is the value of all these treasures? To which the gentleman replied, sir, they are priceless. And Brother Coyle responded, yet they are nearly so valuable as one soul in the sight of God. Souls are precious in the sight of God. If you would, turn to Psalm 49. Psalm 49, and we'll be reading verses 6 through 9. Psalm 49, 6. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. The worth of a soul. Have you ever considered the worth of your soul? I'd like this morning to look at four reasons why your See and understand just how much God values our souls will not only feel better about ourselves, but will feel better toward those around us as well. We'll realize that they have a soul that is precious to God, and we'll want to do all that we can to see that their souls are saved and they're brought to a saving knowledge of the truth that's in Jesus Christ. So, first, your soul is of great worth because it is priceless. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now here Jesus is saying that, your soul is worth far more than all the wealth in the world put together. If you were to gain the whole world and yet lose your own soul, you would be condemned for all eternity. You would have nothing. Have you ever asked yourself that question? It's an important one. What would you be willing to give in exchange for your soul? What would you trade for it? Well, there's nothing that you could give that would even come close to equaling its worth, both to God and to yourself. And yet, we often fail to realize just how very important our souls are. And we neglect to take care of that, which is most important and most precious to us. Our souls are priceless. Secondly, your soul is of great worth because God created it. Let's turn to the first book in the Bible, Genesis. <clears throat> Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. And we'll be going down to verse 26. Genesis 1, 
Genesis chapter 1, we'll read verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, if you would go to chapter 2, down to verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Your soul is precious before God because God created it. This text reveals that you and I are made in God's image. Now, what does that mean? Well, unlike God's other living creations, we're able to think, we're able to reason, we're able to make decisions, we're, we're creatures of intellect, and God has blessed us with marvelous abilities. Look at the compliment God himself gives mankind in Genesis chapter 11. The compliment is found down in verse 6, where God himself says, Now nothing will be restrained from them, that is, the people, which they have imagined to do. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. The Lord has essentially said that nothing man could imagine would be impossible for him to accomplish. Now, that is quite a compliment. Uh, to man's abilities. Recent technological achievements bear witness to the fact that God created a marvelous being when he created man. We think of the, um, the progress made in space travel. Uh, man has been to the moon and back. Uh, he sent probes out into space. He sent uh, robots to Mars, and on and on and on, the Hubble telescope, those things. Uh, scientific advances that have been made over the years. Uh, breakthroughs in medicine. We can think of heart transplants and, and all kinds of wonderful uh, breakthroughs in medicine that have occurred. Uh, great electronic inventions, such as we're, we're using now, computer science, which we're using now. Uh, electronic technology, all these things we can think of. Uh, to bear witness to the fact that God blessed man and created man with a tremendous intellect. So we, like the psalmist in Psalm 139.14, can joyously and legitimately say, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Marvelous are thy works, were fearfully and wonderfully made. Thirdly, your soul is of great worth because it is eternal and will return to God. God created us as eternal beings. He gave us a soul that will live forever somewhere. The question is, where? And this can be seen in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit, the soul, shall return unto God who gave it. So we have an eternal soul, and it's going to live on. When, the, when we die, when the soul leaves the body, the soul is going to live on in eternity somewhere. And where we spend eternity dep depends upon the decisions that we make in this life. That's why this is so important. This life is kind of like a trial period where we're being tested. And we can either choose to serve sin, which leads to death, or we can choose to serve obedience, which leads to righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Now, obedience unto righteousness is doing the will of God, the Father, that is revealed in his word. Uh, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now those who do his will will live eternally with him in heaven. And those who do not do his will will receive everlasting punishment. That's not the category we want to be in, brothers and sisters and friends. Matthew 25, 46 says that the unrighteous shall go away into everlasting father, life eternal. We want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So God made us a living, eternal soul. And where we spend our eternity depends upon the decisions we make in this life. And that's why these decisions are so very important. And finally, your soul is of great worth because Christ died to save it. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 tells us that the result of sin, the payment of sin, the, the consequences of sin is death. And this death is eternal separation from God, away from his goodness, away from his kindness, away from his compassion, away from his presence. That in itself is hell. So uh, from this, we can determine that all men sin, and because of that sin, are condemned to die. And that is bad news, isn't it? That's bad news. But in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we see Jesus come into the world to save his people from their sins. That's what the name Jesus means, Savior. He shall save his people from their sins. That is good news. That's what you and I need. And I like Romans 6.23 because it not only gives us the bad news, but in the same verse, it gives us the good news. Um, for the wages of sin is death. That's bad news. Eternal separation from God, away from his presence, away from his goodness. That's bad news. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is good news. So Christ died to save our souls, the righteous for the unrighteous, the, the sinless for the sinful, the godly for the godless. He died to save us from our sins. And I think. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 puts it very well. And that says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, yours and mine, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So that is good news for you and me, brothers and sisters. That is the gospel. And the gospel is good news. Let's turn now to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and let's read verses 24 and 25. The speaking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He did that for you. He did that for me. He bore our sins, yours and mine in his own body, on the tree, on the cross, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. That's our calling. By whose stripes you were healed. By Christ's wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's a beautiful verse. That's a power pack verse. Christ died to save our souls. And he now serves as shepherd and overseer of our souls. The word overseer or bishop means that he is the superintendent of our souls. He is the 
officer in charge of our souls. And the word shepherd suggests that he is the one who watches over our souls. That's a beautiful picture. Christ is the guardian of our souls. Our souls belong to him because he paid the ransom price to redeem us from sin, from the clutches and consequences of sin, which is death, eternal separation from God. So this morning, we've learned that our souls are of great worth in God's sight, and they are precious because, first of all, our souls are priceless. Can't place a value on them. They are priceless. Secondly, God created our souls. Thirdly, our souls are eternal and will return to God. And fourth, Christ died to save our souls so that we could live with him eternally in heaven, in his presence. Now, doesn't that make you feel important? Doesn't it give you a sense of, of self-respect, of self-esteem, of self-worth that our Lord Jesus Christ would do that for you, would do that for me? We are of great worth and value in the sight of God who created us in his image. Now, the danger of not realizing the worth of our souls, the danger for not preparing our souls for eternity can clearly be seen in the parable of the rich man that's recorded in Luke chapter 12. So let's go there. Gospel of Luke. Chapter 12, and let's go down to verse 16. So Jesus is teaching here, and he, he speaks this parable to those around him, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? Well, he had so much, he didn't have anywhere to put it. Now, he had some options, didn't he? He had some different decisions he could make, but here's what he does. So he says in verse 18, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. So he's decided to uh, build bigger barns to, to put all of his stuff in. And then in verse 19, he says, I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He's all set. He's taking care of everything. He's all set, or so he thinks. But, verse 20, God said to him, thou fool, ah, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And Jesus applies this and uh, made some real errors in judgment. He focused on the physical and the material. He took care of things in that realm, but he totally uh, ignored the spiritual, and he did not make preparation for his soul and where his soul would end up after he died. He neglected that. The question then is, have you considered the worth of your soul enough to make adequate preparation for eternity? What will your condition be when, like the rich man, your soul is required of you. Will you be prepared to meet your God? Are you prepared now? Are you ready if the Lord will come within the next 10 minutes? Are you ready? <clears throat> so these questions that we're asking will be answered by the decisions that you make in this life, perhaps by a decision that you make today. The rich man made a mistake in thinking that he had much time left. He had many years 
left. But that wasn't the case, was it? So it's urgent that we get our lives right with God if they're not already, that we get our lives in order, that we make preparations for our soul and our eternity. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the eternal destiny, our souls, uh, the eternal destiny of our souls should be of the greatest importance to us and should take first priority in our lives as to where we will spend eternity. So if you've not yet decided to put Christ on in baptism, if you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, then you're still in your sins. You need to repent of those sins and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says. And we urge you to take advantage of this opportunity to do this, and we can help you with that. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says these beautiful words. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's what we need. That's what we seek. Take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. If something in your life is preventing you from having a right relationship with God the Father, then make it right today. If you need to repent, God is always calling us back to himself, calling us to repent. Repentance is a decision, a conscious, deliberate decision to change, which is confirmed by action. So it is a conversion. We turn away, we convert, we turn away from sin, and we turn to God, and we seek to do his will. And if we're seeking to do his will, he's going to help us with that, isn't he? Your soul is certainly worth every effort you could put forth. Your soul is worth anything and everything you could do to make it right with God and prepare yourself for eternity. We hope that this uh, the Word of God, which is alive and powerful, sharpened the two-edged sword, has um, touched your heart today. And we pray that if uh, you are subject to the gospel, subject to the invitation, that you would let us know, contact us, and let us help you, let us study with you, and you too could have the hope of heaven and eternal life for your soul.